Good morning, One Church. Welcome on this Sunday morning. Grateful that you guys joined us here today. My name is Adam Schindler, I'm one of the teaching pastors here at One Church, and I'm glad that you guys came and joined us. We, uh, as a church, we rented out our facility this weekend to a conference, and it was great having some various friends and people from all over the city, lots of different churches came and gathered here for a time of worship and teaching. And I came for a little while and it was a really great time. So if any of y'all were here for the conference, thanks for joining us again today on Sunday morning. Um, Pastor Blake last week talked about the Holy Spirit and introduced this new series that we're calling Cadence, getting in step or being in step with the Spirit of God. And last week was Pentecost, Shavuot in the Hebrew. It's a festival that recognizes the giving of the Torah, the scriptures at Mount Sinai, and God's inhabiting presence with us. And one of the favorite things that Blake talked about last week was he talked about the power and the presence of God. And one little throwaway line that he made, I'm going to make into a whole sermon today. He talked about cultivating eyes to see and ears to hear what God is doing. Because it's only the voice of truth that will hold us in the days that are upon us. Okay, so today I want to talk to you guys about seeing or about specifically hearing the voice of God. Have you guys heard God speak to you before? If you believe in Jesus, you heard him talk to you, okay? Maybe just that one time, but you've heard him speak to you. Okay, and it's about tuning in to what God is saying to you, specifically in your own life and in the world around you. And I'm, I'm an insufferably thinker, rational type person. And I read philosophy and I read theology and politics and geopolitics and culture. And I do a lot of that. And then my brain sort of gets exploded most of the time. And at night before I go to bed, I read spy thrillers. They're not trashy. They're spy thrillers. And I love these spy thrillers because I don't have to like think about deep concepts. But I also, I, I love spies, right? Because I like to get intelligence on what the enemy is doing, right? Spiritually, I like spying on what the enemy's doing. But I love the, the, the spy kind of people because they've trained their natural senses to pick up all kinds of information that, that most people don't have any clue about, right? Like Jason Bourne in those films, like he understands when he walks into a room, he's analyzing, he's checking accents, he's reading people, he's smelling, he's doing all kinds of things that most people are just sitting having a cup of coffee. He's picking up all this information. And I love that because guys, we know this even in the natural. You know, the radio is a simple example. There's all kinds of frequencies out there and it's not until you tune in that you capture the information. Focusing your eyes on a particular thing will necessarily weed out all the other things that are around you. Neurologically, this is true. You have just tons of information coming in through your eyes that your brain is processing. But when you focus on something, that is where your brain puts its attention. And so cultivating a focus on what God is saying to us right now to who we are, to who he is, what he says in the world, that is something that we can cultivate. And we can become people that pursue hearing the voice of God. Okay, now, I got a, I don't know if it's an elephant in the room or not. Maybe it's an elephant in my own head. But I got to address it right up front. There is danger in culture for people to say, God told me. You guys ever seen a problem with that or experienced it? God told me that such and such, usually it's God told me such and such was going to happen. Right? And then it doesn't. And it causes problems. And it makes people question. It makes people wonder. When I was a worship leader, um, I was single. I was 24, 25, leading worship in a vineyard church, about 2,000 two, 2, people. And I was up front playing. And I had a handful of girls. This is my beautiful wife. It wasn't her. She wouldn't do that. But I had a handful of girls come up to, we didn't know each other at that point. And they'd say, God told me we needed to go on a date. <laughs> and I was like, well, he didn't tell me, but all right, you know. I went on one day, I'm like, yeah, that wasn't Jesus. That wasn't the Lord. Something was talking to you. 
And I'm not, I'm not telling you this morning for that kind of stuff, right? There's a whole world of that, and I think that there is an aspect of how God speaks to us, to speak to us, to encourage one another and give each other words. But I want to cultivate and talk specifically here today about how we can cultivate a personal hearing for what God says is true about us and true about the world around us, okay? So there are three foundations that I want to share with you today about hearing the voice of God. <clears throat> the first one is that hearing God is not mystical, it's covenantal. Okay? And there is a, a mystical element to God is outside of, you know, sort of our five senses or what we would call the natural order, the natural law. Okay? And so this phrase has been used in a variety of times throughout the, the years to talk about mystics, people that say that they hear God. And those are to set them apart from all the other people that don't hear God because they're a mystic and they hear God. Right? I don't believe that that's actually the foundational truth in the scriptures. I do think there are mystics and they have different kinds of relationships with God. But the scriptures in Exodus chapter 19, we're just going to look at verses 16 and 17, okay? When God spoke to all of Israel, the Ten Commandments that gives them the Torah, he spoke it out in the hearing of all the people. Look at this, verse, Exodus 19, verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. They took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Okay, and Sinai was wrapped in smoke because God descended on it in fire. All right. When God told his people that I'm going to thunder from Sinai and birth a new nation, the politics and the covenant of freedom that gets given at Sinai, when God did that, he told the entire nation, the assembly of Israel, to cleanse themselves for three days and draw near the mountain. And he came down in smoke and fire and he spoke out in the hearing of the whole nation the words of God. Okay? This is not him quietly giving something to Moses and Moses coming down and giving the things to the people. That happens after God speaks it out to the nation. Did you guys know that? This was the founding of the covenant of Moses with Moses and the nation. Right? And if you know the story, when God thunders from the mountain, they get terrified. And what do they do? They're like, oh no, you talk to him, Moses. He's going to kill us. Because they were slaves in Egypt, and if you talk to Pharaoh or you talk to a deity, oftentimes they would kill you, right? So they're still thinking this God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is going to kill us. So they put Moses up in between them and God, right? They're scared. That begins a problem that begins to get rectified finally in Jesus. That's another sermon. But how many of y'all know that we can't do what Israel did and put a man as a mediator for hearing God. You guys, I love Pastor Blake. He's a wonderful preacher. He's a great teacher. He's a great pastor and leader. He's a mediocre golfer, but he is a terrible substitute for God. Okay? Blake, if you were here, I would still say that. You're a terrible substitute for God. So I don't want you guys to think that you need to come here to one church on Sunday morning and count on Blake to let you talk with God. You need to count on Blake to love you, to lead you, to lead this staff so that we can reach out into our community, love, grow, and go, right? That's what we count on our pastor for. You can't depend upon him to hear God. Now, he can help you. He models that and demonstrates it. But we don't want to stick Blake in the place that the Israelites stuck Moses because they were scared to hear God for themselves. Because it's a covenantal promise that you will hear the voice of God. Okay? Because in the beginning, in the New Testament, okay, we're not just going to stay in Exodus. In the beginning, John 1.1 1, 1 says this. 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. In the very beginning, God calls himself the Word. So do you think the one who self-identifies as the Word still has some words to speak? Maybe? That word, word, here in this word, it's a lot of words this morning, is logos. Okay, and I want to talk to you about the three words for word. Because there is a belief in a, in a message in parts of Christianity that says, you know, God no longer, the word has been canonized and God no longer speaks. Because that has been canonized, that's finalized. That's just not true. And it's not biblical. And I'm not going to deconstruct that theology today. But I want to help us understand that there is a word that has been finalized. It's the written word. And the Bible in the New Testament has three primary words for word. And the first one is logos. And that logos word means the incarnate one. Every time it's used, it's talking about this major concept that comes out of Greek philosophy. And, and the writers of the Gospels employ it to talk about this eternal incarnation. It's a reference to the Messiah. Okay, and while the Messiah is no longer on the ground in the flesh, the Logos has not yet been completed. The Logos is eternal, right? The Logos hasn't been done away with. The Logos is present. So the Logos is the eternal word. The second word for word is this word graphe. And graphe is where we get the, the it's a Greek word, it's where we get graphite, a writing utensil, right, in pencils. So the grapha word is a word that we most usually associate with the Bible. Or there's also a Greek word, biblios. All right, and then in Luke, uh, we're not going to show this, but Luke 4, verse 16 is the story when Jesus goes to his hometown of Nazareth, and he stands up on what's called a bema. It's this stone in a synagogue where you would unroll and read from the scrolls of Torah. So Jesus gets handed the scroll of Torah. That word scroll in Luke 4 is biblios. Okay, that's an, that's, it references a written papyrus or parchment, a physical material object, okay? So he gets handed a biblios, a material object. I don't have one. You have a Bible in your hand, right? That's a biblios, a scroll, a material object. He unrolls it, reads it, and at the end he says, today, this word was fulfilled in your hearing. That word at the end of Luke 4 is graphe. And he's referencing Isaiah's prophecy about the spirit of the sovereign Lord descending upon him. Okay, so we've got a physical material scroll that was handed to him. And the point of that scroll was to demonstrate and live out the graphe word in that moment. Okay, something that was written by the prophet Isaiah on the scroll. Does this make sense? How these things work together? Your Bible contains graphe words. Your Biblios contains graphe written words. That is the thing that has been completed. Right? The Bible's been canonized. The scriptures say you cannot, in the book of Revelation, don't add or subtract any more things from this. There's no more people that are getting written word revelations of God that are on par with scripture. I don't care how many YouTube followers you have. If you're saying that this is an addendum to the scriptures on par with the scriptures, you're speaking a word that is anti-biblical, right? That word has been fulfilled and completed, right? But there's another word for word, and it's found here in Romans. Let's put this up, Romans 10, verse 17 only. Skip ahead to 17, if you will. So the scripture says this, faith comes from hearing. Where do you get faith? Reading the Bible? No, it comes from hearing. So I'm talking to you about cultivating ears to hear this morning. Faith comes from hearing. Where does hearing come from? The word of Christ. What word for word is that word? That's the word rhema. It's not graphe, it's not biblios, it's not logos. So keep this verse up here for a minute. We need to understand what Paul is saying here to the church in Rome. All right? He is saying, if you want to have faith, 
You have to cultivate hearing the rhema word of God. This is where faith even comes from. Rhema is a word that references what God is saying right now. It's the spoken word in a lot of instances. A lot of usages use that word to speak out. But the rhema word of God, Ephesians 6, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, it's not grafe word, it's rhema. How do you fight in the spirit? You use the rhema word of God as a weapon. Did you guys know that was the sword of the spirit and not the biblios? I'm going to connect this. I'm not being, you know, heretical right now, even though it may feel like that. So I want to talk to you about how the rhema, the graphe, and the logos all work together. And it's key that we understand that it's the written word of God that is canonized and done. But the incarnation of Jesus, though he's in a different form now with the Spirit, the Logos is still here and the Rhema is still here. So I traveled around and taught Bible studies a decade or so ago in, in Texas. And I was teaching a Bible study in Austin at a friend's house. And we were doing this in outreach. And I teach like really long-winded ancient history Bible studies. And so he invited some of his people that were all into geopolitics and conspiracy theories to come hear me talk about the Bible. And because I guess they liked it. And I did this whole session and there was a guy who I didn't know if he was a believer or not. I was with a bunch of non-believers and it was sort of an outreach event. And there was a guy that I didn't know that just showed up. And we're in a home and I give the talk and it's, I thought, I thought it was pretty good. And at the end of it, I start talking with this guy, and he's, I could tell he's really troubled in the spirit, and he just had problems, and he was hurting. And I asked him if I could pray for him. And it was a bit of a risk, because I'm there all by myself in an environment where there's not Christians, and nobody's familiar with praying for people. But I asked him, can I pray for you? And he's like, yeah. So I put my hand on his shoulder, and I started to pray for him. And as I was doing that, he sort of like got down on his knees. I'm like, oh, you're like ultra spiritual. <laughs> I'm like praying for him with my hand on his back. And then he crumples down on all fours and starts to cry. And I'm like, oh, I stopped at that point. I didn't want to chase him onto the floor. And I'm thinking, this, this is a little strange. I'm trying to manage the room. I'm feeling a little bit insecure. I'm worried about this guy. Why is he crying? And so I'm standing there kind of managing this situation personally with my friends that aren't sure what's happening, whether I like... What I do to this guy? What's God doing? So I was standing there, and I was doing my practice. I've cultivated this over 25 years, and I just was like, God, what are you doing? What are you saying right now? I don't know what to do. This is weird. People are nervous. I'm nervous. He's crying. What are you saying? John Wimber, who is a mentor um, in the faith, he likes to say, he was one of the guys that founded um, the Jesus movement back in the 60s. He likes to say, you need to put yourself in situations that make you look like a fool unless the Holy Spirit shows up. And that's what I was taught in the vineyard, you know. And so I'm in this spot and I feel like a fool. And I say, God, what are you saying? What are you doing? Trying to, trying to tap in to what God may be doing and saying right now. And as soon as, well, it wasn't immediate, but I was there for a few minutes. And then I heard this phrase, and I'm pretty sure it's out of Matthew. It's the parable of the ten virgins. Um, and yeah, it's Matthew 25, 23. It was the, the phrase, well done, good and faithful servant. Right? I just heard that phrase and I knew it was a Bible verse. So I asked the Lord, what are you saying? I'm asking for a rhema word, right? And I hear a graphe word. It's got an address in the Bible. It's a Bible verse. I'm like, okay. So you ask God, you hear, then he tells you something. Then you have to figure out what to do with it. Right? There's the information, interpretation, and application. So I was like, what do I do with this? And he said, I want you to speak it to this guy. I'm like, okay, when? Just blurt it out. How do I do this? So I'm having this dialogue. And he said, wait. And when I tell you, get down on your knee and speak to him. Whisper it in his ear. So I stood there for a few minutes while he cried and he kind of composed himself. And then I just felt like I didn't hear God thunder from Mount Sinai and there was no fire manifesting on the heads of the people around me. I just had this impression I heard now. 
So I kneeled down next to this guy who's on the floor, and I, I didn't pray for him. I just said what I heard. Matthew 25. I said, well done, my good and faithful servant. And when I spoke that to him, he was on all fours. When I spoke it to him, he let out this shriek, and he crumples onto the ground in a fetal position and starts shaking and screaming. And I was like, oh, no, this is... This was the opposite. I was trying to get you back up. And now, like, are you, are you manifesting? Are you demon-possessed? What's happening? And so, again, this situation with my friends and this guy, like, this is the wrong direction, Lord. But, you know, it looked like a fool unless God comes and does something. You know, and this wasn't my fault. Right? You told me to do this, Jesus. So, after a few minutes, I don't remember the exact time, he comes to and he tells us this story. And he tells us that his friend had committed suicide that weekend or in the last couple of days. And his friend, it was because of relationship that he had with his father. And his friend was struggling. He was hurting and he was scared and he had a struggling relationship with his father. And he said, I have been contemplating suicide because I want to hear my father tell me, well done, good and faithful servant. That kid had been contemplating killing himself just to hear God tell him something. And I stood there and I said, you don't have to kill yourself. God told me to tell you. God sees you. He knows you. And the trajectory of that young man's life, I didn't see him again after that. But I knew in that moment that his life had taken a different path. Why? Because I asked God for a rhema word, he gave me a grafe word, and when I spoke the rhema word at the right moment, that introduced him to the incarnate word. This is what the word of God does. It's not a one-dimensional thing that you just read your Bible, check the box, you're holy now, go on with your day, right? The Bible, without the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, turns into religion so fast, you can't imagine. So we need the Spirit of God speaking to us. And I just invite you, this is a great practice. If you would like to cultivate hearing God in a personal way to encourage others, I encourage you here to do this very simply. When you do your devotional time, if you have a devotional life, encourage in some capacity, read the Bible and try and connect to Jesus. It's pretty good. If you do that, add to that devotional time Look for a verse that sticks out, a sentence or two or a couple of verses, something that just like really resonates with you, and then add this to your time. Say, Father, would you put on my heart someone that I know that needs to hear this verse today? Right? And if you hear something, or you guess like a thought pops into your mind, or maybe you'll see a picture, or you'll just be like, oh, I'm thinking about Frank. Text them and say, hey, I was praying this morning, reading the word, this verse really stuck out. Wanted to send it to you. Hope you're having a good day. Right? At the very worst, you send a friend a Bible verse. At the very best, that is the verse that they need to hear in this moment that touches their heart and tells them that God sees them. When you practice that and you start getting feedback, you begin to learn how to hear and release the rhema word of God. That's a simple devotional practice, and I invite you to try it. You know, maybe one church could be a church that we just text each other Bible verses in the morning, trying to encourage one another with the Word of God. You know, you don't have to become a bunch of prophets, just text messengers. <laughs> so, the second part of this foundation is that hearing God is not mental, it's spiritual. And this was a hard lesson for me, because I'm super mental. So, Corinthians 2, verse 13 and 14. We're just going to start there and only do these two. 13 and 14, it says this. Paul writes, And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit, for they're folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. This was really hard for me who has a philosophy degree and read all the world major religious texts and I love to like go and lead people to Jesus with my great words and high fluent speech. But Paul had all of that and he said, I didn't come to you in, in words of wisdom, 
but in demonstration of the Spirit, because the things to understand the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, you don't get them only through your mind, right? You've got to receive them in your spirit, and I don't have time to unpack that, but we have to have an awareness that our spiritual lives are key to understanding God and to hearing him. Okay? If you really want to know how to do that, talk to my wife because she's the one that taught me a lot about that. So the words that are not rooted in the Spirit, they lead us to the wisdom of men. I could have sat down with that guy and given him a little mini sermonette about suicide and about how it's wrong and if you do this you're going to go to hell and I could have given him a lot of my worldly wisdom from the Bible about the thing but it was the rhema word of God that broke through and touched him and I got that information not because of my learning but because of the Holy Spirit and if you learn to cultivate that you now have power on the earth to release the word of God you don't get to make up the Word of God, but you get to release the Word of God when you learn how to do that, to cultivate that heart with the Father and the Spirit. That authority comes out into the earth through your voice. They're not your words that came from the Father, but you're the messenger, and you're a messenger of hope. Okay, but that is a spiritual practice. The third piece of this, y'all, is that hearing God is not a party trick. Right? You don't get to go to a cocktail party and have people be like, oh, give me a prophetic word. Like, some people do that. It's not a party trick. It is your inheritance as a child of God. Okay? If you're a believer in this room, you've heard God speak to you. Because no one comes to the Father except through the Holy Spirit that draws you. And you didn't achieve salvation through a rational thought process where you finally worked your way into the cognitive knowledge that believing in a set of principles could save your soul. That's not how it works, y'all. If you believe in your heart and confess through the lips, Jesus Christ is Lord, you're saved. How does that get into your heart? Hearing. Where does hearing come from? The word that God speaks to you. So if you believe in Jesus, you hear his voice. Jesus says this in John 10, 27. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Right? For a Jewish rabbi from the Galilee who talked only in parables, this is pretty straightforward. My sheep hear my voice, you're my sheep, you follow and you hear. Okay? That's foundational to the Christian life. You don't have to get the gift of hearing God by some impartation from the man of power with the hour to lay hands on you and get laid out. You don't need that. You have it because you believe in Jesus. Now what I just described, I've seen and I've experienced, even to my chagrin. It happened to me last week. I was speaking at this conference in Oklahoma with a handful of people that are very different than my norm. And they were laying hands on people and praying and a lot of people were falling over. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that. Uh, a lot of people were doing it. And I was like, mm-mm. Mm -mm. You know, I'm like, I see you put the hand on the forehead, and if it goes forward at all, I'm like, you're pushing. I don't want, mm-mm. You know, I'm like, mm-mm. So I didn't even come for prayer, but I was one of the speakers. And so they were like, at the end, they're like, Adam, come up for prayer. I'm like, oh, I almost, I almost ditched this. But I came up for prayer, not because I was scorning it, but I didn't want to get pushed. I came up for prayer, and I'm standing there. I'm like, I'll receive whatever you have for me, God, but I'm not falling over. You know, don't push me. I'll push you back, man of God. And he put his hand on my head, and he just spoke a word. And I'm not kidding you guys. Instead of going back, my legs just crumpled up underneath me, and I fell right on my butt. And I'm like, what the heck, God? There's no spiritual point to that. That's what happened. And I'm like, I don't get it. I don't get it. I didn't make it up, and I'm not filled with demons. Something happened that makes you wonder. What's a sign of a wonder? It's a sign of the covenant, and the wonder makes you go, I wonder what that is. I'm not sure. That one's for free. That's not in my notes. <laughs> Shouldn't have been in my mouth either, too, I guess. Um, but 
even if you don't want to hear God, sometimes he'll talk to you because you have to hear him. And when you cultivate that as a son, something beautiful happens. This is John 16, verse 13. He said, we're going to John 16. He said in verse 16, or John 16, verse 13, I'm stalling. He says this to the disciples. Something. I didn't write this one down. Can you go back one? Let's just start here. He says to the disciples, I have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are yet to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Holy Spirit's coming, and he's going to do a lot of talking. And that talking didn't stop after a certain period of time. He takes what is the Father's and he speaks it to the children. Okay? This is the inheritance that we have as sons and daughters of God. That he would speak to us. What does he speak? The things the Father is saying. The things that the Father is doing. What is one of the most important things that the Father did in the Son empowered by the Spirit? I think it's the resurrection. Jesus, you know, didn't resurrect himself. Right? He didn't lay in the tomb dead going, mm, resurrect. How was Jesus resurrected? Paul says it in Romans. Now the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is now at work in you, willing and working in your body, giving life to your body. How did Jesus get resurrected? Holy Spirit. The Spirit from the Father, brought the Son back. And what did the Spirit of God get to do after the Son came back? He was released out into the earth. Let's pull up John. I'm all over the place. Good job, people in the back. Let's do this. John 7, 38. This is what Jesus says. He says, whoever believes in me, as the Scripture says, out of his belly, the word in Hebrew or the Greek idea is belly, the core of you. We translate that to heart. But out of the core of you will flow rivers of living water. Now, Jesus said this about the Holy Spirit, whom those who had believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. What's the passion of the Christ in the glorification of Jesus? Death and resurrection. The Holy Spirit is tied to the resurrection of Jesus and the pouring out of the glory that Jesus said he wanted to give to you, the sons and daughters of God. Jesus gives glory to the Father by pouring out his Spirit on you. And the Spirit will speak to you and lead you and remind you of all kinds of stuff. Does this make sense, church? This is your inheritance as a daughter and a son. And the most important question that I believe we need to get clear from the scriptures, if you don't have it clear, is what is true about death? What is true about death? And you may be saved, and you may have had that transactional thing that happens in the mystery and the spirit. We get resurrected or transferred into the kingdom of light out of this kingdom of darkness. But we're all still here, and we're all still, some of you, scared of death. I was terrified of death. I'm still a little bit shaky sometimes. When I was a kid, I would grow up, I had these night terrors from the time that I was five years old until about 24, 25. And I would just be terrified. Every night I would go to bed. And I was terrified. I couldn't sleep. I could visualize what it was like to be dead. I was alert and I was alone forever. And it terrified me. And I would go in and I would like scream after an hour and I'd run in shaking to my parents. And my mom was my spiritual rock and I was telling her and she was like, Adam, death is nothing to be afraid of. You know, it's like when you sleep. You like to sleep. I'm like, well, not anymore if it's like death. <laughs> like, no, I don't want to go to bed. I'm going to die. So every night I had to turn on worship music. Steve Kurtz Chapman and Amy Grant 
I could play all of Amy Grant's Heart in Motion on the recorder with my nose as a child. Like, I would go to bed playing that. That was too much information. But <laughs> worship was a veil that protected me from the fear of death. And for 25 years, I had that. I felt it the other day while I was sitting in a movie watching a pretty good aerial fighter plane movie. And I just got terrified with death because someone flew a plane and ejected, spoiler alert, there's planes that blow up. I got scared, but I still feel this. So this was a terror that I grew up with, all right? And I'm a dad now of three kids. I just sent two of them off to CIY. But I want to tell you about an experience my five-year-old daughter had a few years ago. And she got to know her great-great-grandfather. Is that right? Great-great? One great? It's not that great. Make America great, 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 great. Great grandfather. She got to know him, though. And he was a wonderful man. I didn't know him that well. I knew him maybe eight, ten years, the end of his life. But he was a wonderful, interesting man. His name was the Right Reverend Billy Lucas. And this is a picture of Billy Lucas with a less, he, Billy Lucas is there on the left side. This is in 1954. He was in Paris. And there's a lesser known Billy that's standing to his left. That's a Billy Graham was that guy there to his left. So it's Billy Lucas and Billy Graham hanging out in Paris. These two Billys used to do crusades together in San Antonio in 1947 before Billy Graham went off. And so my, my grandpa, Billy Lucas, was quite the guy. He told me one time, sitting in his lazy chair, he's like, I remember that one time I witnessed Elvis on a train to Chicago. I was like, Como se dice, what? He's like, I, so he tells me a story of when he witnesses to Elvis because he was scared of flying, so he took a train and he saw that the, there was a pastor in the back that had a collar on. So one of Elvis's guys came back and got him and brought him up to first class and he witnessed to Elvis for four hours driving to Chicago. I was like, oh, thank you for, for that. He told me when one of the Mossad agents took him in and showed him some of the temple vessels that are being made in Jerusalem in the 70s. I'm like, you got some great stories, Billy. But my young daughter, Sophia, knew him pretty well and would play a lot at their house, you know. And then, uh, was it 2014 or 15? 14? In 2014, he had, I think he had a stroke and he went into hospice. And he spent a year in hospice. Okay, and this is a picture of our family Easter 2014. Um, and that's Billy there in the bed. And right to his right, if you're looking at the picture, my daughter, Sophia, kind of holding herself with her Aunt Kelly in front of her there. That's the one I'm talking to you about. She's five years old in this photo. Right, and she loved her papa. The other two were too small. Little boy Judah up there with grandma. She used too small. But Sophia, the old one, understood this. And about four or five months later, around Christmas time, he had another turn and he was about to die. And we went over to the house and she would go into that room, and he was ashen, and you can pull that down now. And he was ashen, and he looked very different from that photo, and very different from when he was in his 30s with Billy Graham. But she saw him, and she came out, and I don't know if you guys have been around death. I don't know how hospice workers do it. They're remarkable people. They held our family so well in that time, but we come out of the room with my daughter, and we sit down on the chair, and she looks at me and she's like, Daddy, is that going to happen to me? And immediately I'm like, oh, spiking emotionally, got to be a father. And I was like, oh, yeah, baby, it is. And then I'm like, oh, that's, is that the right thing to say? <laughs> yeah, you're going to die. I'm, mm. And then I recovered. I was like, oh, it happened to Jesus, too. She's like, it did? I'm like, yeah. She's like, oh, okay. She went down and started playing with her brother. So later that night, I'm in my office. It's late at night, it's 10 o'clock or something. And I'm right downstairs, and we have a second-story house. And I hear this cry coming from the stairs. And I'm like, oh, that's Sophia. And that's not the, my brother hit me with a shoe cry. You know, <laughs> that was terror. And I jump up and run around and I look up the stairs and I see my daughter, a little five-year-old girl standing there and she's white and she's ashen. And I walk up the stairs and I'm like, baby, what's wrong? And she says, daddy, 
What if you die first and us kids are all alone? I'm like, oh man. I can't say what I'm thinking. I'm like, heck yeah, that's what's happening. I'm not putting you in the ground. I can't say that, you know, she's five. That's still too much. And I can't lie to her. I mean, I could. I'm like, oh baby, that's not gonna happen. I could give her my theology, but she's five. Could I talk to her about the substitutional atonement of Jesus? Quote to her the scriptures, maybe. But I'm spiking emotionally, I'm terrified, I'm feeling all this stuff, and my daughter's looking to me for wisdom. And so I picked her up, I took her into our bedroom, I sat her down on the bed, and I did what I do when I don't know what to do. God, what are you saying? What do I do? And I heard him say, ask me what's true about death. So I looked at my little girl, terrified, and I said, Sophia, there's times in our lives, and it happens to me a lot, that I don't know what to do. And we have to learn how to cry out to God. We have to learn how to cry out to him. It's like, so we're going to do that right now about death. Let's ask Jesus what he says is true about death. You don't have to do anything, just listen. I'll pray and you listen. I said, you may hear something, you may get a picture, you may feel something, just listen. So I prayed for her and I held her on her bed. She's still ashen and trembling. And after about a minute or two, I began to experience what I experience when I feel the presence of God. I feel heat in my body. I mean, it feels sort of like electricity. And I could feel him. I was like, yeah. And then after a few minutes, I asked my daughter, I was like, Sophia, did, did you see anything? She's like, no. I was like, well, you know, did you feel anything? She's like, no. I said, well, did you hear anything? She said, yeah. I was like, what'd you hear? She said, Jesus told me that he loved me and he would always be with me. And I got down, I looked her in the face, I'm like, baby, you just heard God, right? I know that's the Bible. I don't have to check with any prophets. That's the word. I'm like, you heard Jesus. And her whole countenance had changed, right? She wasn't ashen and afraid. Like, she's realizing, God just talked to me about the scariest thing on the planet? And she looked at me and she said, Daddy, how did he get so strong? I was like, oh, I don't know. Let's ask him when we meet him. But y'all, I watched my five-year-old daughter encounter death. I never saw death, but I was terrified my whole life. She stared death in the face. God spoke to her about what's true, and it changed her life. She's not living in the patterns that I was living in. That thing was broken off my line. Two weeks later, her papa died re right after that. Two weeks later, we're at the funeral. It's an open casket. And this little five-year-old girl in her pretty little Sunday dress comes up to me, wants to get picked up, and we walk over to the open casket, and she touches her papa and cries. Then she gets down, and she runs off, and she dances and plays with her brother and sister and eats grapes and does a bunch of stuff I don't want her to at the memorial home. Then she comes back, gets up, goes to papa, cries, comes back down and goes and plays. Like she learns how to feel the grief, express the grief, face the death, and then go be a child, a daughter of Jesus. If God can talk to a five-year-old who's facing the fear of death about what's true and have it change your life, do you think he wants to speak to us about that? Who's got some fear about what's going on in the world? Maybe you've got fear of the death of your gas budget for the year. Maybe it's other things. Maybe it's cancer. Maybe it's economic collapse. Maybe it's national collapse. God wants to tell you what's true about death. And not so that you can just hold on until you die. So that you live a life that is full. That you become people that can confront death and speak truth into the moments of death and release the life and the power and the hope of heaven. Because for those that believe in God, there is no death. Though our bodies die, there is an eternal life, and we are his messengers in this planet to speak those words of life. And that is not acquired through the mind in the cognitive process. That is a spiritual truth 
that God wants to root in you this morning by his very word. So would you pray with me? Living God, we ask in Jesus' name that your spirit would speak to this body right now at One Church in Fayetteville, Georgia, and everyone that's watching online, that you would speak to this body of believers and tell us what's true about life and what's true about death. That we would hear it from your voice. We would hear it from your word because it is a covenantal inheritance as sons and daughters that we hear the voice of God speak truth and life. I just pray and agree and speak out a Holy Spirit declaration according to the word of God that there would be a release of the power and the presence of the spirit of Jesus Christ in this place. That we would increase in our seeing and hearing from heaven. That we would increase in our understanding of the truth of the written word. That we would increase in our encounters with the living word. And that we could be people that would release the spoken life-giving rhema words of God in our church, in our city, in our state and nation. Father, make this place a place of the word, a place founded in the text, a place founded in the incarnational encounters with God, a place founded in the now spoken word of God, that we at One Church are a people of the word, the text, the logos, the rhema of God. We thank you, Jesus, that you're true and you're speaking to our hearts today. We love you, Daddy. We bless you that you breathe life where there's death. And you give hope where there's fear. And that you give love where there's been bitterness. And I just want to pray right now. This is a word for you guys today. Cut off the root of bitterness. Cut off the root of bitterness. This is a word for me. Cut off the root of bitterness. You can't move any further down the journey in your relationships when you hold on to this root of bitterness. The Lord says, cut it off. And it is the love of Jesus that will weigh, <laughs> that will waylay the ax to the root of bitterness right now. Receive the love of Jesus in that place that you're hurt. Yeah, you were hurt. Yes, injustice was done against you. But you can't hold that forever. Jesus says in John 20, 21, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. That doesn't make you the Pope. That makes you somebody who can release sin. Because if you don't forgive and hold on to it, it keeps coming back and it turns into bitterness. And I know the Lord is saying, his love will waylay and it will lay to the root of bitterness in your life. And you can move on and let that bitterness go by receiving the love of Jesus this morning. If that resonates with your spirit, spend two, three minutes during this next song and say, Jesus, do it. If that's you, help. Teach me. Speak to me. We love you, King Jesus. I bless you in your name we pray. Amen.